A U.S. Navy patrol boat fired warning shots today when an Iranian ship came dangerously close in the Persian Gulf. Have a look. The Iranians came within 150 yards of the USS Thunderbolt, but backed off after the shots were fired. The Thunderbolt was taking part in exercises in the Gulf. First time since President Trump took office that a U.S. Navy warship fired warning shots at a fast approaching Iranian patrol boat, as you mentioned, at 150 yards in the Persian Gulf, risking a collision. Now, this Iranian vessel was from its Islamic Revolutionary Guard, Guard Corps, ignored repeated radio calls from USS Thunderbolt, which also launched flares and sounded the danger signal, five short blasts from the ship's whistle to warn the fast-approaching Iranian gunboat. The incident happened while a formation of U.S. Navy and Coast Guard ships trained in the northern Persian Gulf today. It's the first time in six months a U.S. Navy warship fired warning shots near an Iranian vessel. On Capitol Hill today, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee reacted to the breaking news. We see increased aggression all over the world. Uh, recently, we also had very aggressive activity by the Chinese. Of course, we've seen a pattern of this from the Russians and now the Iranians. So it's clear people are testing us all around the world. This is a Fox News alert. The U.S. intelligence community is warning of a pending rocket launch from Iran. That's according to two senior U.S. officials. The last one came just days after President Trump took office, prompting the White House to put Tehran, quote, on notice. Now, another missile launch by North Korea could also be coming. Some predicting that could be as soon as tonight. U.S. President Donald Trump issued a veiled threat against Iran, warning Tehran to adhere to the terms of a nuclear deal with world powers or else face big, big problems. A week after certifying Iran as complying with the 2015 agreements negotiated by Democratic President Barack Obama, Trump made clear to thousands of Rakhine supporters that he remains extremely wary of Tehran. Trump administration officials said new economic sanctions against Iran were being prepared over its ballistic missile program and for contributing to regional tensions. According to Iran state media, Deputy Foreign Minister Abbas Arachi has said that if the U.S. passes new sanctions on Iran, it will give a quote-unquote definitive response. On Tuesday, President Donald Trump delivered a veiled threat to Iran warning Tehran to comply with the terms of a nuclear deal with other world powers or else face quote-unquote big, big problems. While Trump remains wary of Tehran, Iranians are also unsure of Washington. But President Hassan Rouhani has been quoted as saying, The Quran also advises that if enemies are really pursuing peace and want to put enmity aside and act appropriately toward you, then you should do the same. The U.S. has voted for sanctions on Russia, Iran, and North Korea. The yeas are 419, the nays are 3. The overwhelming move against the three countries comes despite Donald Trump's objections to the legislation, and the bill was passed with support from Democrat representatives as well as fellow Republicans. These three regimes in different parts of the world are threatening vital U.S. interests, and they are destabilizing their neighbors. It is well past time that we forcefully respond. It now needs to go before the Senate, but support in the lower house is solid. These sanctions are a clear signal that the United States will hold President Putin and his close associates accountable for their actions. They are also a declaration that Congress can and will act even when President Trump refuses to do so. A spokesman for Russian President Vladimir Putin told reporters, quote, Right now we can say that this is rather sad news from the point of view of Russia-U.S. ties and their further development. This is no less disheartening from the point of view of international law and international trade relations. Russia has warned that any U.S. decision to supply Ukraine with lethal weapons will escalate tensions. The Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov says that such a move could destabilize the region along the front line in eastern Ukraine and further aggravate the already complicated situation. Peskov reiterated that supplying arms to Ukraine will set back peace efforts and move all sides away from the resolving the Ukrainian crisis. Comments come after U.S. Special Envoy for Ukraine Kurt Volker said that Washington is considering sending weapons to Ukraine to help government forces in the fight against pro-Russia forces in the country's east. Russia said late on Tuesday that war games it's conducting with the Chinese Navy in the Baltic Sea, which has become a zone of heightened tensions between Moscow and the West, do not pose a threat to anyone. 
The exercise, which began on Tuesday, is a sign of how closely Russia and China cooperate militarily and will be seen as a show of force by Moscow in an area where NATO and Russian aircraft often intercept one another. The exercise, called Sea Cooperation 2017, follows similar ones held last year. More exercises of the same kind will be held in mid-September in the Sea of Japan and the Sea of Okhotsk, according to a China state news agency. Beijing has some strong words for Washington. Stop dangerous and irresponsible surveillance. China's foreign ministry says frequent surveillance is not good for mutual trust. Chinese warplanes intercepted a U.S. Navy surveillance plane over the East China Sea this week. China has been safeguarding the order and safety of flight over international waters in accordance with related international law and regulations. For a long time, U.S. military aircraft have frequently approached coastal area of China, which threatens the maritime safety of China. We urge the U.S. to immediately stop surveillance to prevent this from happening again. Tensions between the United States and China have flared up again in recent days as their differences on a number of issues from North Korea to international trade are becoming more apparent. The world's two superpowers have been flexing their military muscles for what they call defensive purposes, but it's becoming clearer that it's becoming more of a warning to each other. Over the weekend, one of two Chinese fighter jets came within 100 meters of an American surveillance plane in the East China Sea as they tried to intercept it, nearly causing a mid-air collision. Beijing has also reportedly beefed up its defense along its 1,400-kilometer border with North Korea in what is being seen as a possible reinforcement in case China has to aid the North if war breaks out with the U.S. China's military maintains the move is normal combat readiness and routine training. The two nations are also locking horns over U.S. sanctions on Pyongyang. U.S. lawmakers on Tuesday passed sanctions that penalize any foreign person or entity that uses North Korean refugees as labor and punishes those who provide the North with crude oil, discreetly pointing the finger at China. China's exports to North Korea rose in the first six months of this year despite regime being subject to strict trade restrictions due to its nuclear and missile provocations. According to figures from the Seoul-based Korea International Trade Association, China's exports to North Korea amounted to nearly 1.7 billion US dollars in the January to June period, up 18 percent from a year ago. Beijing's jet fuel exports to Pyongyang also rose 18% to $22.6 million over the period, although China suspended such exports in April. China's imports from North Korea over the same period were down by almost 25% after Beijing suspended coal imports from the North. North Korea could have a nuclear warhead capable of reaching the continental U.S. in 2018. This revised timeline by U.S. intelligence agencies comes as officials reportedly admitted they underestimated the determination of Kim Jong-un. North Korea has accelerated its ballistic missile program this year. In early July, the country carried out its first successful test of an intercontinental ballistic missile. Since the beginning of 2017, the North has conducted nearly a dozen other missile tests that we know of. The U.S., Japan, China, and South Korea have been trying to figure out how to deal with North Korea's actions. The U.S. House of Representatives voted this week to sanction North Korea, along with Russia and Iran. CIA Director Mike Pompeo said last week that he's hopeful the U.S. will find a way to remove Kim from his growing nuclear program. In response, North Korea threatened a nuclear strike on the U.S. or any other country that tries to remove Kim. Reports have speculated North Korea is gearing up to fire another missile in the coming dates. This one will supposedly mark the country's Victory Day anniversary, July 27th. Israel's removal of metal detectors from Jerusalem's most sensitive holy site has failed to appease Palestinians. Thousands prayed outside on Tuesday night, heeding a call not to enter in protest at Israel's actions. Earlier, the Israelis said they decided to replace the detectors with what they called smart checking devices at the Temple Mount, known to Muslims as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Palestinian president said all new Israeli measures put in place since July the 14th until today must be removed so that things can go back to normal in Jerusalem and we can resume our work regarding bilateral relations. The UN's Middle East envoy has called for tensions to be eased ahead of Friday prayers. 
Israel's response to the Palestinian leadership was furious. Israel's top priority is to maintain the safety and security of all Temple Mount worshippers and visitors. The Palestinians' top priority is to ignite violence. Abbas not only has the audacity to claim he seeks peace, but actively funds, promotes, and glorifies terror. The dispute is about far more than security equipment imposed in the wake of the killing of two Israeli policemen. The site is highly symbolic for both sides. They're under pressure to calm the row, but some say various factions have an interest in stoking tensions further. Sharing out asylum seekers among EU member states is lawful, so says the advisor to the European Court of Justice, backing the bloc's quota system. The court's been urged to dismiss a case brought by Slovakia and Hungary challenging obligatory relocations. The program was designed to ease pressure on Greece and Italy after mass arrivals of migrants, mostly fleeing conflicts or poverty in the Middle East and Africa. Many members have dragged their feet in implementing the scheme, however, with opposition led by the two eastern EU states. A final court ruling is expected later this year. A man has been detained after trying to cross into the European Union from Morocco. The assailant, who was armed with a large knife, attacked a police officer and shouted Allahu Akbar while attempting to enter the Spanish enclave of Melilla. This footage shows the man, dressed in a blue shirt and white shorts, walking across the border, waving the knife. Spanish police keep their distance before one officer runs up behind him, strikes him on the head with a traffic bollard and knocks him to the ground. So as Islamic State loses ground in Syria and Iraq, many Europeans who joined ISIL will now be returning home again then. ISIL is crumbling in Syria and Iraq, rapidly losing territory, strongholds and most importantly, followers. An estimated 5,000 fighters travel to the Middle East from Europe 20 to 30 percent are said to be returning. Now, the spectre of returning jihadis wrecking havoc on European streets has haunted governments for a while, but tackling this growing threat has proved problematic. Weeding out extremists who pose the biggest risk is the greatest challenge, with many seemingly slipping through the net, all willing to fight European law and justice on their own terms. I do not want to come back permanently. My return will be purely for the lawsuit. I know I have no future in the Netherlands. A big stamp has been printed on me. You're a terrorist. You've joined the battle in Syria. And I want to defend myself. The Netherlands says it respects the rule of law. So which suspect must have the right to defend himself in a court? I think the charge against me is unfair. The biggest obstacle is the lack of a cohesive pan-European policy on returning fighters. Some seem to show remorse about travelling to join the caliphate, like this jihadi bride from Kent. The public, though, show little sympathy. Over 17,000 people signed a petition just to stop her returning. The British government, though, has now started using so-called temporary exclusion orders to control the movements of terror suspects. But even this policy lacks a fully united front. In engaging with the intelligence services and with the police and with the border force, we make sure that they have the tools to track them and keep them out where we can. The British government's response has been to try to make it uh, impossible for them to travel, to restrict their ability to travel, to take upon themselves the ability to remove passports and, strangely, to deny people the right of return, which is legally a very questionable decision by the British government. Now the picture is even more mixed across the channel. Countries such as Germany, the Netherlands and Denmark, they offer rehabilitation programs, even with counselling, employment and education. Sweden takes things a step further. In fact, one suspected Swedish jihadist was arrested at Heathrow Airport. Now, Swedish authorities refused to fully cooperate with the investigation of the British security services, which contributed to the ultimate collapse of the trial. According to sources, he is now back in Scandinavia under a new identity assigned by the Swedish government. European freedom of movement, returning terror suspects always seem to be one step ahead of the security services. And with such wildly differing approaches in tackling a growing threat, it's no wonder cooperation, intelligence sharing and coordinated policies are still heavily lacking.
Members and allies of the LGBTQ community have organized the first military unit of its kind to combat ISIS. International volunteers created the unit and named it the Queer Insurrection and Liberation Army, or Tequila. The International Revolutionary People's Guerrilla Forces, or IRPGF, announced Tequila's formation July 24th on Twitter. IRPGF is part of a larger group of foreign fighters joining Kurdish forces in the fight against ISIS. IRPGF said Tequila seeks, quote, to smash the gender binary and advance the women's revolution, as well as the broader gender and sexual revolution. It added, quote, members have watched in horror as fascist and extremist forces have attacked the queer community and murdered countless of our community members. Members. ISIS is known to throw suspected members of the LGBTQ community off rooftops or stone them to death. Recent social media posts from IRPGF include statements like, We shoot back, and queers smashing the caliphate. President Donald Trump said on Twitter the U.S. will not accept or allow transgender people to serve in any capacity in the U.S. military. Trump said in a series of tweets Wednesday he consulted with generals and military experts on the issue. And he added the military should focus on, quote, decisive and overwhelming victory and not the, quote, tremendous medical cost and disruption that he says transgender people would entail. Trump's announcement comes a little more than a year after then-Secretary of Defense Ash Carter lifted the ban on transgender people openly serving in the military. The Pentagon was supposed to start letting transgender recruits enlist this year. But last month, current Defense Secretary Jim Mattis said he was delaying the new policy because he needed more time. Transgender people already serve in the military, and it's not yet clear how Trump plans to enforce the new ban. When ISIS is expelled from the city, women there are finally able to regain freedom. That's what's happening in Mosul, Iraq. Under ISIS's discriminatory laws, women and girls were often forced to stay at home. They also couldn't dress colorfully or pursue education. If they disobeyed, morality police would come after them. Women or their husbands could be whipped or fined. But in another area of Iraq where ISIS is still in control, women continue to face these issues, along with difficulties accessing health care and other necessities. That's why a city's liberation from ISIS can be so empowering for women. So as Mosul begins a slow rebuilding process, shops are being refilled with colorful cloths, and women are returning with hope. The cholera outbreak in war-ravaged Yemen is set to hit 400,000 cases this week, but the World Health Organization says there are signs the three-month-old epidemic is slowing. The heads of three United Nations agencies traveled to Yemen to witness firsthand the scale of the humanitarian crisis and to step up combined efforts to help fight the outbreak, the biggest in any country in the space of a year. A devastating civil war and economic collapse has left millions of Yemenis on the brink of starvation. A dramatic fall over the past month in the number of people dying from the disease each day suggests the WHO's strategy of setting up a network of rehydration points to catch patients early is working. But the British-based NGO Oxfam has warned the Yemeni rainy season from July to September would increase the risk of the disease spreading further through contaminated water. HIV is a critical issue for tens of millions of people around the world. The virus can spread quickly, particularly if care isn't taken with medical waste. And most troubling to those fighting it, it's very diverse, genetically speaking. A new mosaic vaccine might be our best hope yet at ridding the world of one of its more pernicious bugs. Trials are still in their earliest stages, but researchers are optimistic because every single person treated developed an immune response to HIV. One of the first steps to getting a proper vaccine started. iRobot's Roomba robotic vacuum cleaner has made a real revolution when it comes to in-house cleaning. It's a dream of any family to keep their home clean without actually having to do all the work. However, this smart vacuum cleaner may be collecting more data than dirt. iRobot says Roomba's greatest benefits are that it saves time. It's good for those who are disabled. It has advanced cleaning features that can detect changes between surfaces such as hardwood flooring and carpet. And then there's minimal maintenance. So if the battery is running low on the device, it will recharge itself, enabling it to last for years. And after all, who wouldn't want somebody or something else to do all the dirty work for them? 
However, you may want to go back to vacuuming the old way because Roomba will soon be doing more than collecting your physical dirt. According to media reports, iRobot will use Roomba to collect and sell floor plans of your home and track how often Roomba empties the canister, determining how dirty or clean a household is. Now, this could change the way you are targeted online and on social media. For example, if you clean often while using Facebook, your email, or Google, you may start to see Amazon advertisements showing cleaning tools in order to get you to buy more. To make matters worse, in March, iRobot completed an upgrade that made Roomba compatible with Amazon's Alexa, allowing companies like Apple, Google, and Amazon to have more access to the way in which you live your life. Billionaires Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg have been trading barbs over each other's understanding of artificial intelligence. Musk has argued AI could pose an existential threat to humans, an idea that we've already seen on the big screens thanks to Hollywood. He's called AI the scariest problem and said robots would eventually be able to do everything better than humans. But earlier this week, in a Facebook Live video, Zuckerberg disagreed with Musk's concern. If you're arguing against AI, then you're arguing against um, you know, safer cars that aren't going to have accidents. And you're arguing against um, being able to better diagnose people when they're sick. And I, mean, I just don't see how, how in good conscience a, a, a some people can do that. Musk responded to that comment with a tweet calling Zuckerberg's understanding of the subject limited. All drama aside, AI has caused split reactions from other respected scientists and tech gurus. Some, like Neil deGrasse Tyson, aren't scared of the future of AI and argue the technology could be good for humans if it's managed well. But others, like Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking, agree with Musk that AI is worth concern. In 2015, Hawking and Musk joined thousands of others in an open letter warning autonomous weapons could lead to a global AI arms race. So if you live in Texas over the last couple of days, you may have looked up in the sky and noticed like this weird haze that just didn't really belong. Like, yeah, I know it gets hot and muggy in the summer sometimes, a little bit hazy, but this was a little bit more hazy. You know what that actually was? Seriously, it was dust from the Sahara Desert in Africa. It's amazing how the atmosphere works sometimes. So this does happen from time to time this time of year. Um, I remember it happening when I lived in Huntsville, Alabama. We had a couple of days where we had Saharan dust around. So it really just depending on what the setup is in the atmosphere, and uh, where the steering currents are uh, bringing all that dust, basically you can end up with it in places like Florida, Texas, I mentioned Alabama, really anywhere in the southeast especially. But you see on this water vapor imagery, I think it does a good job of showing you um, where the dust can be, generally where it's drier, and you've got one little area up here in the northwestern Gulf of Mexico um, where basically that dust has been brought over 5,000 miles from Africa to the United States. How about that? Flooding from monsoon rain in western India has swept away much that was in its path, leaving a rising death toll, streets swamped and vehicles submerged. Gujarat state is among the area's worst hit, the deluge stranding many and turning religious temples into new water-soaked attractions. The monsoon has also hit eastern areas of the country where residents say floodwaters are yet to recede. I don't know what has happened. Normally the water goes away, but this time the water is not going anywhere. From the sky, the extent of the flooding is easier to gauge. Whole expanses of land are consumed. Tens of thousands are homeless and in need of aid. Indian Air Force personnel spot a man clinging to an electric pole a rope is lowered with a safety harness attached and he is eventually pulled to safety. Hundreds of people have been rescued by the Air Force this week. Also in the air, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, assessing damage and the loss of life. He has promised around $77 million in financial aid for those affected. New wildfires have been breaking out in southern France, posing threats to residents and holidaymakers and burning forest and scrubland. 10,000 people, including 3,000 campers, were evacuated overnight as a fire swept across a stretch of the Riviera. 
The past week has also seen thousands of hectares destroyed in Corsica, as well as other parts of southern Europe. More than 500 firefighters were called in as flames whipped up by strong winds threatened residential areas on a peninsula west of Saint-Tropez. The authorities moved people out of their homes and campsites, forcing them to take refuge on beaches where they spent the night. There was better news further along the coast as emergency teams said another fire was no longer advancing. France has asked for help from neighbouring EU countries and ordered several water-dropping planes. In two days, more than 5,000 hectares have been destroyed and some 20 firefighters have been injured. Despite the occasionally terrifying skyline, no deaths have been reported, unlike in other parts of Europe this summer. Finally, America strong, the family escaping a fire and the firefighters who bravely went in to save the family dog. And it turns out they weren't the only heroes. Perhaps you heard about that moment last week when firefighters from the Bakersfield, California Fire Department went back in to rescue a pet dog named Jack. When little Jack was pulled out, he was unresponsive. The family so worried would their little dog survive. Hold on, we're going to give him some oxygen for The quick thinking firefighters then grabbed a kit they rarely use, an animal oxygen mask, giving the dog oxygen. Within minutes, they revive little Jack and he's reunited with his owners. Well, tonight we've learned that that life-saving pet oxygen mask, designed small enough for a pet, was actually purchased for the fire department after two Girl Scouts from Troop 376, the Girl Scouts of Central California South, raised money selling t-shirts. Haley Amos and Kylie Green. We did lots of research and we realized that the fire departments needed them. Pets have a different face than humans, so they have smaller and bigger sizes for the pets because they don't have the same and it fits them well. The two Girl Scouts raising $2,400, buying 37 pet oxygen masks, one for each fire department in their city. We really, really love, love pets. They love pets, and Jack's family loves them, because tonight they tell us their dog is back home recovering from the animal hospital and getting spunkier every day.